Good morning. Good morning. I see there are already some people waiting and uh, some questions that I will get to and uh, even some speculation because Eric hadn't heard from me that, uh, you know, maybe that I'd be late. Well, I'm not late. But, you know, I got a number of things that I do in the morning and, uh, and uh, then I finally get around to uh, Eric uh, sends me a link so that I can uh, follow this on uh, my iPad where I can see the questions. At any rate, today I want to, before I get to your questions, I want to talk about something that comes up. I finally get around to uh, Eric uh, sends me a link so that I can, uh, I thought I muted it. Okay. You know, how many words can you learn? So I've said you can learn a hundred words a day. So as often happens when I say something like that, and sometimes I say it to be a little provocative, um, although it in fact is true, uh, then I often get a lot of pushback. No, or you can learn them, but then you forget them and stuff like that. Or what do you mean by know a word and so forth and so on. So before I get into showing you why, you know, how, so I've said, because our statistics at Link really better track how many words, you know, you add to your known word total every month. I can see that in my statistics and I'm going to show you that. So I'm going to talk about how many words you can learn in a month. And this is quite important because learning a language is essentially about acquiring words, all right? So if I look at my Arabic or fire, uh, Persian, I kind of have a sense of how the grammar works. Now, there are some issues in Arabic as subjunctive, and sometimes it's used and sometimes it isn't. And in any case, most people don't speak for on the streets. And so there's lots of fine points, but I've got 80, 90% of the grammar. Uh, I can't necessarily produce it, but I understand how the language works. The same is true with Persian. I kind of understand how it works. They also have a subjunctive and they have, you know, they have different things. They have a future when it's written and they don't use the future when they speak. And, and uh, you know, there's somewhat, sometimes different forms of the word depending on the spoken language versus the written language. So there are all these things that you kind of have a sense of. However, if I go to read something, if I go to read an article from Al Jazeera, the biggest obstacle I have is that I, I don't know the words. Um, if I knew, you know, and, and so let's say there's 30% new or unknown words there or 40%. That makes it very difficult to work your way through that. Uh, it used to be 60%. So I am moving towards, you know, fewer and fewer unknown words. And I see that because if I open a lesson, there's more white and white means that it's a known word. So then the question is, so what do you mean when you know a word, people say, you know, uh, well, I, the way we measure it at Link is that when you read something, if you don't look the word up, you know it, all right? Now, you may find that the next time you see that word in a different context, you don't know it, which is fine. And then you might save it again. And the, statist the statistics adjust. But the basic principle is that we are learning from content what matters is, can we make, can we derive meaning from this content? So if we are missing words, we don't know what they mean, we have to look them up. So typically on a link lesson page, you have blue words. Those are words that you have not seen before. But you may already know those words, but you haven't seen them before at link. So they're blue. So therefore, if you don't save that word, if you don't create a link, as we call it, where you pass over that word, then the assumption is you know that word. That's what the system says. You don't know that word. If you don't know the word and you look it up, it's now yellow. And over time, that yellow word can move to be, it begins as a status one word. And then when it becomes a status four word, it's known. And it can move to known in a variety of ways. And I have to admit that I don't know all of the the ways in which this happens, but it's primarily when you review them. And when you review them more than a certain number of times and you get it right or whatever, then it moves to known uh, automatically. Uh, or, and this is most often the case with me, I will move them to known manually. Like I'll say, okay, this, this is a word I've seen before. I kind of half sort of think I know what it means, but I'm not confident. I can figure it out from this context, but really I'm not confident of this word. So I might move it from status one to status two or to status three. 
And then I might move it to status four or status four means that it'll still reappear on my spaced repetition thing. But if I move it to the tick, then I won't ever see it again. And so I move these up manually. All right. Now, uh, how many words can you learn in a month? So I'm going to show you my statistics. But the interesting thing is that most of the words we learn, we are not aware that we're learning them. The, the number of words that I learn as a result of having created a link and reviewed the word and moved it up manually in most languages is small. Whereas the words that you acquire naturally over time is much greater. And this is because if you're an English native speaker of English and you're learning French or Spanish, half of the vocabulary in French or Spanish is more or less recognizable to you. And once you get the hang of how it changes into French or Spanish, pretty soon you aren't saving those words because you know what they mean. Or once you figured out something about conjugation, like je vais, tu vas, il va, those are three different words, forms of the verb, but they're the same verb. So after a while, you don't say that any longer. So that in this way, if you are learning languages that are in some way familiar, similar to languages that you know, you acquire vocabulary very quickly. On the other hand, as I'm going to demonstrate in my statistics, when I study languages like Arabic, Persian, Greek, it takes a lot longer. And so you cannot acquire 100 words a day. But even in the Slavic languages, there's a lot of different forms of the same word. Uh, you start, you know, for example, if you're learning, learning Chinese, and once you have acquired a certain number of characters and you start to see these characters reappear in combination with other characters that you may know, then you have a sense of what that word means. Like if you have, for those of you who know Chinese, if you have, uh, you know, xiu gai gai bian, Gai Shan, uh, and you know those characters, you get a sense of what the word means. So you may you may save it once just to confirm the meaning, but very quickly you'll move it to known because that's easy to remember. Uh, similarly, uh, I mentioned this idea of, of cognates or, or what's sometimes called false friends. They may have a slightly different meaning in another language, but they're easy to remember. So there are a lot of freebies. Most words are acquired incidentally. So. Before I then get to questions, I just want to give you a brief demonstration of how this works using our statistics at link. So let me just share my screen. Now, oh, what do we got? Oh, yeah, this is my Twitter feed. Uh, let us go to link here. Okay. So I just looking, I was looking at different languages, and I presume that everyone can see this. Uh, but I was looking at different languages. And so if I take Polish as an example, well, no, well, yeah, we can do Polish. So Polish was sort of my th third Slavic language, fourth maybe after Ukrainian. So I kind of, I, this is looking at Polish all time. So I started poking a bit, learned a little bit of Polish, didn't do much. Uh, and then in uh, basically the summer of 2015 or the latter half of 2015, I guess I must have done a, a 90 day challenge. And I went at Polish heavily. And in one month, I learned 9,594 words. That is to say, my known words total in Polish increased by 9,500 words. So, you know, each month was 3,000 words each month. So that's a lot of words. Uh, now, that's because I knew Russian, Ukrainian, Czech. So let's look at the case of... Now, Russian was the first language I did here at Link. So you'll see that I went, I sort of struggled, struggled, struggled. And this is often the case when you're in a language that I'm in that situation right now. Uh, with my Arabic and Persian. But as you start to get a hang of the language, uh, different forms of the same word, better understanding of the context, all of a sudden you can start adding a lot of words 
to your known work totals. You can also read more and read more new stuff. Like I'm still in the situation in Arabic and Persian where I'm rereading a lot of the old stuff because I still can't remember the words and I still can't fully understand it when I hear it. But once I get better at the language, then I can go and read more and more new stuff. And at that point, I'll be adding, I mean, maybe not 4,000 words a month, but a lot of words uh, to my uh, known word total. Because here in Russian, here I'm dealing with a, a different writing system, the Cyrillic writing system. And I'm dealing with a brand new language family, which has fewer words from other European languages. It does have some, I don't know what the percentage is, but that would not account for this, these spikes in my monthly, you know, uh, uh, increase in known word total. This is because I am able to read more, read more new material, more familiar with the context, uh, more familiar with how the language works. So that was Russian. If I look at, a, let's see, another interesting example is Romanian. I really only studied Romanian for a few months because I was going to Romania. I mean, I haven't done anything on Romanian since. But within a couple of months, I got up to 20,000 known words. And the reason for that is that in Romanian, 70% of the vocabulary is easily identifiable from Italian. 20% is identifiable from Slavic languages. And there's another 10%, which is the original, uh, you know, whatever was there before the influence of these other languages. So in a case of very similar languages, like a Spanish speaker who goes to study Portuguese or vice versa, they can add, <laughs> you know, thousands of words. Then, in fact, they know all the words. They know all the words in the other language. So if we're just talking about the issue of known words now, if I, they may not understand it when they hear it, but uh, they certainly have all the words. So if I go now to, let's see, yeah, Czech, again, is going to be very similar. I went through a period of, of you know, very heavy involvement with Czech. Uh, and uh, so in some of those months, and again, Czech came after Russian, so I already had a lot of the Slavic vocabulary, like 50, 60% of the words are recognizable. So it went pretty quickly. <laughs> But if I go now, or even, uh, so Greek is harder. Greek, you know, my peak month, I only had 328 words. Because, again, there's very few common words. It's a different writing system. There's some issues in the Greek uh, spelling where a lot of, you know, sounds can be written in three or four different, I would say a lot, but some. It, it was tougher. It was tougher. Uh, and the other problem in, in Greek was trying to find, ah, this is another issue, is to, to try to find that intermediate content. I had to go from basically the mini stories straight to a podcast that I had transcribed, which was very difficult. And so these are things that influence uh, how many words you can learn in a month. So here I peaked at 328 words. Is that what it says? Or is that 3,000? Sorry, 900. Where I'm up to 8,000, so that's actually, no, that's not true. I did, when I went at it very heavily, later on, I was able to eat, oh, no, that's not daily, that's a uh, month, 3,282 words. Uh, <laughs> that's wrong in our statistic, that's the monthly total. Uh, so there, yeah, so again, you'll see that you pick up speed. As you, um, as you progress in the language, you get more familiar with the language, you can have a, a really, and this was, just prior to my going to Crete, then I made a particular focus and I got up to 3,000 words, not daily, monthly. That's wrong on our statistics. So if I now go to Persian, so you'll see there that I peaked here because I sort of played around with it a bit. Then I dropped it uh, in preparation for going to um, Morocco where I focused instead on, on Arabic. And now uh, I have been uh, working harder at it. So this it keeps on saying daily, but that's not correct. It's monthly, 460, 586. Now, so I'm getting, let's say 500 a month of uh, Persian that is added to my known words total. And that's bearing in mind that I cannot, that I'm spending a lot of time going over already familiar material. I'm not yet at a stage where I can forge ahead 
into enjoyable new material all the time because when you start doing that you can really pump up your known words total but you can see here that i went at arabic fairly heavily got it up to say 900 a month and then of course uh this then dropped off i guess we were traveling because i did a lot of traveling uh then i bumped it up prior to going to morocco and since then again i i find arabic more difficult than Persian, so I'm doing a lot of reviewing of existing material to get a better sense of the language. So I'm adding 300 and some words, new words, to my known words total, together with the, whatever it was, five, six hundred of Persian. So it's about a thousand a month. So I guess in conclusion, now let's stop this. So in conclusion, you know, I think the number of known words that you can add to your known words total is going to vary from. I mean, even in difficult languages like Persian and Arabic, and, and I'm doing both of them, and that's slowing me down. Like I was, I'm today is a transition day. I go from Arabic to Persian, but I was just starting to get into some. Uh, actually, I'm going through Asimil again. I'm enjoying the Persian Asimil more the second time around, or the third time around. And but then I have to lay the book down and go into Persian, so that slows me down because I want to get forward to that stage where I can start. Really, I, I don't enjoy reading the articles from Al Jazeera because, or France 24, which I have transcribed, because they're still too difficult. But if they were just a little bit easier, I would move more quickly and I would acquire more new known words. Um, but anyway, 1,000 to 10,000, that's the range of what you can achieve in a month, in my opinion, on a program of, you know, really, you know, focusing in on listening and reading. And I do very little deliberate, you know, uh, memorizing flashcards. I do it on a random basis occasionally, but I don't, it's not a big part of my learning strategy. Now, before I answer your questions, a couple of comments here, people say, well, you know, how do you know if you know a word and stuff? It's passive knowledge of the word. I, I believe that passive vocabulary is very important because in most situations, comprehension is more important than what you are able to say. If I'm watching a movie, if I'm reading a book, if I'm listening to a podcast, what matters is what can I understand? And if I understand a lot, it's a bit like a snowball. If I don't understand much, then the range of things that I can listen to, read, whatever is limited. The more I understand, the richer I get. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. The more words I have, the more interesting things I can explore, the more vocabulary I'm going to get. So the passive vocabulary is tremendously important. And I don't worry so much about what I can say now. I worry about what I will be able to say a year from now. And in order to be, and I want to be in meaningful conversations because then I'm going to get vocabulary from the native speaker who will be using native speaker will always have a much broader vocabulary than I have. And I'm going to be able to, you know, acquire those words if I can hold up my end of the conversation. In order to hold up my end of the conversation, I have to understand what they're saying. So passive vocabulary is very important. Now, when do these words convert into active vocabulary? What can we do? That's another discussion. Uh, I don't think we're aware sometimes of when these words convert and there are strategies that can help you convert them into uh, active words. But, you know, we can't measure that at length and I think that the, the, the easiest thing to measure and the best measure of your potential in a language is you, the size of your passive vocabulary. That's why we measure it at length. And without wanting to brag about it, if you have, not, I have 90,000 words in Russian, that might be equivalent to 30,000 words in English because there's so many more different forms of words in Russian. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not in the Olympics. I'm not trying to brag about this. But it's it's sort of it it it's a motivator. It's a, these are milestones. I know that I'm at seven thousand five hundred words in Arabic and two thousand words in Persian. When I get to fifteen thousand words in Arabic, I'm going to be taking off. When I get to ten thousand words in Persian, I'm going to be taking off. So I'm very much motivated to increase my known words total, which is my passive word vocabulary at link. And I think that. We pick up speed as we progress, and to get from 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 words a month uh, is not difficult. Okay.
Now, let us see what we have in the way of questions. Okay, we go right back to the beginning. Can you talk some more about the boat trip you took to get to France when you first went? I believe it was when you were working with people. Okay, so here's a question. So it's not related to today's subject, but so uh, I decided in Montreal to go down to the dock and I uh, wanted to hitchhike to Europe. And so for three days, uh, I went on to ships. I said, hello, uh, can I speak to the captain? And they said, fine. And I mean, it just shows you how much the world has changed. I mean, today I would have been <laughs> arrested or suspected of being a terrorist or something. But in those days, they said, fine. In most cases, I got to be the, see the captain. I said, look, uh, I'm prepared to work for free. I want to get across to Europe. Uh, have you got any, uh, you know, job for me that I can do? And on the third day, the captain of this uh, small German ship said, uh, yes. And so I went across and um, the crew was half German, half Spanish. And so we all have stereotypes and the stereotype is the Spanish speakers are all, you know, uh, fiesta and whatever, have a good time. And the Germans are hardworking. Whereas on this trip, all of the Spanish, they were from Galicia, uh, my, a lot of fun they were. Uh, they were hardworking and the, the Germans uh, couldn't wait until dinner time and they would, you know, consume uh, a dozen beer before they passed out. So that was kind of interesting. It was a very small sort of uh, ship. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Just a heads up, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Hey, a little bit about language learning and age. Age is not a factor. Uh, you know, you have to use your brain. You have to use your brain. And if you use your brain, you create new neural connections. It doesn't matter what age you are. Uh, since the, so in, uh, I guess I was 60 or 58 or whatever, I wrote my book. And at that time I spoke nine languages. And I'm now working on language 19 and 20. Okay, I'm 73. So that's 13 years since the age of 60. Uh, yesterday, my wife and I played golf with a neurologist from Nashville, Tennessee, him and his son, very nice a couple of guys. And we talked a bit and I said, oh yeah, neurology. So I can't resist relating everything back to language learning. And I said, I read a book once written by a German, uh, you know, cognitive scientist, neurologist, who said, uh, to learn uh, anything, we need repetition, but we need novelty. And this gets back to, in language learning, we can't just go over the same stuff all the time. We get the sort of diminishing returns. Uh, we have to go and find new stuff. Uh, and I've talked about interleaving, learning and coming back. And he said, yes, he says, if you don't do anything new, you aren't creating new neural circuits in the brain. You have to create these. And we can create these at any age. Uh, research has shown that the that, uh, brain remains uh, plastic, so that uh, it's all a matter of motivation. And initially it's tough. You have to force, you have to force this, uh, you know, these new networks to be created in your brain, not a factor of age. Well, I hope to learn more. Your name is so long, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for your information. I also enjoy listening to your audio book, The Linguist. The book has helped get into listening, something I really didn't do a lot of. Okay, yeah, no, listening is so key. Listening is so key. It, it's, the, it's the core. Listening is the core. You listen, you don't understand, you want to read it, you got to get into it. Listening is so portable, you can do it anywhere. But it's not just listening for background noise. It, to me, it's listening. That's why I like it. I get on our playlist and then if I if I'm listening and I might as I said the other day random scramble the playlist then I hear something that I don't really understand so I go and look at my iPad uh, what playlist am I listening to right now I can click on it and get to the lesson I can read it again listening triggers a lot of our learning ah blah, blah, blah. Listen, there is however one thing that has been on my mind were the girls you talked to in Grenoble impressed with your sweetest a long time ago uh, I mean once you can communicate with people, however poorly, you just become part of the group. I didn't ask them if they were impressed. Uh, if they were, I was with a bunch of Swedish people and they were all speaking Swedish and I was chiming in uh, with however limited my Swedish was, I was just part of their group. Uh, I don't remember. 
Uh, okay, I'm reading Rich Dad Poor Dad and there's a lot of words that are extremely unknown for me. most of them are about financial stuff and I end up torturing myself because I don't know the meaning. Uh, well, the, Mateus, I would I would advise you to buy the ebook and import it into Link, and then save those words and expressions and get to know them. If, if that's if that kind of uh, you know that terminology is important to you, then you should focus on and do a lot of reading. And don't just read the one book; read that book and read another book and read a variety of different things that relate to financial stuff. Or if you don't get the e the ebook for that book with the financial terminology, then go find our articles on the internet and import them into link. I find beginner content pretty boring, but I don't know enough to read or listen to stuff of interest. Should I stick to beginner stuff or what? You kind of have to do a bit of both. This is Nikos. Uh, you have to kind of do a bit of both. Um, you know, obviously we need to get started with the beginner stuff, but then we s explore some of the more difficult stuff. It's too difficult. We beat back and go back into the beginner stuff. And that's what I was saying. Once you reach a stage, where you're more comfortable in the more interesting stuff, then your known words total is going to increase very, very quickly because you're able to actually understand it and move along. But that's something you have to explore for yourself. What your threshold of, you know, for pain is because it is more difficult and it's a, a bit of a struggle to read the more difficult stuff. And yet it's boring to read the simple stuff. So you have to figure out your own strategy. I'm a native English speaker, I have registration, and I have to look up words. Okay. I find it much better to read for fun and information when learning a language, like the links on the website, but I don't study them. Just look. Yeah, that's right. That's how you that's how you progress. How can we learn the spoken language? Not only language in newspapers and more formal writing. To me, you know, the language you get out of newspapers, out of books, it's the base. It's the base. You need that. Uh, the spoken language is not so different unless you just want to say, hi, how are you? You know, how's it going? That's very easy. Other than that, you're going to be talking about some subject of substance and there the vocabulary will be essentially the same as what you're reading. However, uh, what you can do is if you find your favorite TV show on YouTube and it has subtitles, you can import that into Link as a lesson and study the vocabulary. And uh, in that way, you'll be picking up more of the sort of conversational language. But I don't think the conversational language is so difficult to acquire. Ah, uh, da, 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 da. How can we learn this going? Okay. Any tips on what Japanese books we should start reading when we reach now? I'm sorry, I'm not doing Japanese. Maybe Eric has some suggestions. I simply ha have no idea what would be a good next level book in Japanese. Uh, what to do to not get rusty in certain languages? Well, I refresh them. I refresh them at link. If I know I'm going to need a certain language, if I'm, you know, if I'm, uh, I'm sometimes I used to get invited on television in Vancouver to speak, uh, you know, in Mandarin on a panel discussion or something. And I spend an hour or so. And certainly on my way to the radio or television studio, I would be listening to my uh, Mandarin CDs. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about Manda Panda, about uh, pronunciation rules. If you listen a lot, you naturally get a sense of how the language is pronounced. You may occasionally review the pronunciation rules. I wouldn't try to remember them. I would focus more on my ability to notice what I hear. But occasionally you can read the... Uh, I'm using a book dedicated to pronunciation. Well, I think pronunciation is, is not something that we control through reading books. Reading a book with some rules on pronunciation may point some things out to you that you hadn't noticed, but mostly you just have to listen a lot. I... Um, met a guy in Vancouver, actually, who spoke phenomenal English. He was from China. And I said, what did, what did you do? How can you speak so well? You sound almost like a Chinese Canadian to me. I mean, he looks Chinese. He speaks English almost like a Canadian. He said, I had this one CD and I listened to it a thousand times. No, that's what he said. I'm not sure I could do that, but he said that's the secret to his pronunciation.
uh, Chinese characters, I think, uh, you know, do you think writing them and tracing is the best way? Well, initially you may need to trace them, although most resources that teach Chinese characters will give you a stroke order. So you simply have to get used to that stroke order. I found that I had to write them out the first thousand and, and even thereafter, because when I was doing Chinese, we had to write, we had to translate, we had to write essays in Chinese. I found that writing was important for me to be able to recognize them. Uh, is that necessary? I don't know. Uh, I read, uh, you know, Korean. Uh, I have never written Korean by hand. I have never written Cyrillic by hand. I have never written Greek by hand. I've never written Arabic script by hand. And I managed fine. But when I did the Chinese, I wrote them by hand. Okay, uh, if you're not having fun, don't do it. Fun and curiosity may say your brain is secreting the right neurotransmitters. Uh, can you let Zoran know that I may email him about the Hungarian translations? Can you also email me, Steve at link, because then I have your email address and maybe we've already been in communication. Uh, I sometimes don't know if I'm speaking to the same person or not. Send me another email. I will follow up with Zoran. He has a lot of stuff to do and, and I will follow up with him. Hmm. Bonjour, Monsieur Kaufman. Je voulais vous remercier pour votre vidéo. Je suis l'étudiant en interprétation et vos vidéos me redonnent la motivation. Blah, blah, blah. Glad to hear it. Scott, that's all fuzzy, but there are one, maybe two nerves responsible for memory. They're like, blah, 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 blah. Da, hard to tell, basically, whatever. Okay. When you go on vacation, you take a break from studying or do you use the opportunity to try out a new language? Well, I mean, if I'm in Latin America and we were with another couple, the only language uh, activity is speaking to the taxi drivers in Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, didn't really spend much time on any formal form of language uh, training. Uh, okay. Here's one. If you have four years to learn two languages, one for pleasure, one for business, after four years, in, in what order do you go about learning them? Uh, well, I would do now, I would go 80% on the one for business. And then as a treat, I would allow myself 20% of the time to do the one that I uh, am more motivated to learn. <clears throat> Okay, Olair, he says that his listening is, is, emulista uh, turbinando. I'm not sure I know the meaning of the verb turbinando. Ovindo e lendo. A meses listening está turbinando. Does the listening, I mean, listening takes a while to develop, if that's the point. It takes a while to develop. Uh, we can read and understand, uh, and yet when we listen, we have trouble. Uh, you just have to keep listening. Você tem que continuar a ouvir. Do you get more known words out of flashcarding or reading through previous lessons? Uh, reading, reading. Uh, I mean, in other words, do I convert more saved links to known through flashcarding or through reading? Far more through reading. When I'm reading and I see a word that I'm comfortable now, I move it to know. Uh, now, any tips about Russian vocabulary? Lots of listening and reading. That's the only tip. Forget Steve. It doesn't like flashcards. Are you a fan of them? Because they present the word. Okay, that's fine. I hope you are doing fine. What do you think about Russian language? <laughs> I love the Russian language. Um, to be fair, I love every language that I'm learning. I love the Arabic language. 
I love the Persian language, and I particularly like the fact that it's a lot easier than Arabic. Uh, Russian is difficult in the sense that there's a lot of tricky sort of grammar things. I love the sound of the language, and I love the fact that I'm able to understand it when I hear it. It gives me a tremendous sense of satisfaction. And, and that satisfaction that, uh, you know, I can access this world that was, uh, you know, that, that I had very little understanding of before. But that's the case with all the languages that I learned. Do I think Edgar Allan Poe's stories are difficult to read and understand for a, an English learner? I don't know. I'm a fan of 19th century uh, literature uh, in French, in Russian. Uh, I've used uh, in Spanish, even in Italian. Uh, I don't find those particularly difficult, but I have no idea how an English language learner would find Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, how would you approach learning Japanese after learning hiragana or katakana? Well, I think, I think you should learn the kanji because if you're going to read, you're going to come across kanji. So kanji is a major, major task. It's not difficult per se, but it's very time consuming. And I think it's something one should get on as early as possible. And it's just one of those things. You know, when I studied Chinese, there was this uh, Lao San Pian, for anybody who's familiar with uh, Chinese Maoist propaganda, there were the Lao San Pian, the three famous uh, essays, one of which was Yugong Yishan, the foolish old man who moved the mountain. And the idea there was this man was digging away this mountain and everybody said he was a fool and he said, yeah, but I'll continue digging and my son will continue, continue digging and his son after him. So uh, learning characters is a bit like that. It's a tremendous task and you just have to get at it and do it every day and gradually you learn them. Uh, please make a bit about changing tones of Chinese. Uh, okay, Sir Vlad, sorry, I jumped a bit. Uh, the alphabet in Russian. Of all the things in Russian that are difficult, the alphabet is not one of them. Uh, yes, it's strange. Yes, you will never read as comfortably in any new alphabet as you read in the one that you have been reading since childhood. But if you compare that to learning Chinese characters, Arabic, uh, Hangul, it's, it's not so difficult. Just get at it. You're going to continue to confuse, you know, the P and the R and all this kind of stuff, but you just have to keep reading and listening, keep reading, keep reading, and eventually you just get better. You don't get worse. Uh, changing tones of Chinese. Okay, to me, the tones in Chinese is, is a problem. It's difficult. It's one of the difficulties in Chinese. In many ways, Chinese is an easy language to learn, but the characters and the tones make it difficult. Uh, you can try to uh, you should be aware of officially what the tone is, one, two, three, four, ma, 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 ma. But you're going to get a better feel for them if you learn the, if you learn phrases. If you learn phrases, say phrases, hear the phrases. So, and there are things in the tones that sometimes the, uh, you know, we have a boo, you know. It, it can change if it's in a phrase. So you kind of get these phrases in your head and it starts to come out naturally. One of the things I did was I listened to a lot of Xiangshan. Xiangshan are these Chinese comic dialogues where they exaggerate the tones. So if you listen to these comic dialogues, it tends to, again, exaggerate the music of the language. And that's what you have to do with the tones. Yeah, Ashke Foy. Uh, yeah, so if your listening comprehension is 5 to 10%, you just got to keep listening. Listen, don't understand, read, look up the words, review the words, listen again. And, and, and again, this whole idea about creating new networks, so listen to stuff that's old and try to get a little bit more each time, but also push the envelope a little bit by listening to new stuff. Keeps things fresh in the brain, then go back to the old stuff. There it. And eventually, you will improve. Okay, could you give me some advice? Even if I don't understand, do you think I should keep watching your video? Sung Hyun Sung. You know, if there are if there are closed captions, which I believe there are to these videos, I say, I'm Korean, I want to be good at English, that is why I subscribed to yours, but I'm not good at English, I can't understand what you say perfectly. Okay, first of all, don't expect to understand perfectly. That comes much, much later, okay? 
I have put a lot of effort into learning Korean. I don't understand. I mean, my comprehension, depending on the content, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent. I want to get from 30 to 40, 40 to 50, gradually improve. It's a long road. You're, the brain learns. The brain cannot do otherwise than learn. The brain is a learning machine, but the brain learns slowly. Okay, so you have to be patient, but you have to recognize that the brain will always learn. All the stimulus that's coming at it is forcing the brain to rearrange. I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist, but the brain learns. But you have to, you have to keep feeding the brain, stimulating the brain, and it will learn, but it learns slowly. So your ability to understand will improve slowly. If there are subtitles to this video, then you should import that into Link and go over all the words. Because I talk about language learning all the time. So at the very least, if you did all my videos, you would have good vocabulary on that subject. Okay. And, but you can do that with other things. You can do that with television programs and so forth. So writing and tracing Chinese before trying to memorize them first. No, no. First of all, I do not try to memorize necessarily anything. I just found that with Chinese characters, I would, I had these flashcards that were actual physical cards. And I would look at one and I would write it out 10 times on a piece of paper. Okay. But it was squared paper. And then I would stop and I would pick up the second one and I would write it out. And it was squared papers. That, that meant that there were columns. And so I would put the meaning or the pronunciation, like if it's I, wo, I would put W O wo with sound, the tone sign over on the third column. And then I pick up another one. I keep doing that. And then I run into the wall within a few minutes. So then I got to write it again. And then I move it forward. So it was my, before I even heard of the term spaced repetition, I had my own primitive spaced repetition system. And I just did that. And so I did, started 10 a day, took it up to 30 a day. And I would always shuffle old ones in there because I knew whatever I learned yesterday, I was going to forget half of it or more but so it was not so much a deliberate memorization strategy as an exposure strategy if you feed the brain enough stimulus exposure the brain will eventually learn i don't try to memorize i don't test myself i just go through it uh what are the best chinese resources i have no idea i'm no longer doing chinese Mm hmm. <laughs> is it worth when you're listening to a video on YouTube, you change the normal speed and put it faster or should I listen in the natural way? I, I don't see any benefit in, in moving it to faster. Um, do you think languages can help you socialize with people more? Sure. You all of a sudden you can talk to people that uh, don't speak your language. So that's got to, you know, that you can access more people, expand your social contacts. Can I think? Okay, here's another this PewDiePie. I have no idea what PewDiePie is. I have zero interest in PewDiePie, and I hope people will stop talking about PewDiePie here. Why do you think people just not that when you speak their language? Why do I haven't come across? Do you use music as a method to learn? No, I presume you mean songs, songs with words, but I don't use songs. Mm, da -da 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 -da. Uh, Steve, you inspire me. I've been following your channel for two years. I speak presented. Thanks for all you. Thank you. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Mother tongue is Arabic. I've been learning Persian for years. By the time I was A2 or B1, I found myself often understanding Hafez more than my Persian friends. Can you believe that? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> the, the Persian and Arabic are two completely different language families. Persian is an Indo-European language. Obviously, Arabic is Semitic language, like Aramaic or Hebrew. But there are 30% or so Arabic words in Persian, and I find it really helps. And, and I'm very glad that I'm doing them both at the same time, although sometimes I wish I could stay on the one longer. Do you think memorizing phrases will boost the speed of learning? As I've said before, I don't deliberately memorize anything. I expose myself to content, and I expose myself to... Um, you know, if I save a bunch of phrases in link and then I tag them, for example, for, you know, case endings in Russian, 
then I will review those phrases. So I will give myself concentrated exposure, concentrated examples of a certain pattern in the language, but it's always exposure. It's not a deliberate attempt to memorize. Steve is a, a language Zen master. I'm not a master, but I'll tell you that there is a lot in Zen or in the Taoist Chinese, you know, Zhuangzi Taoist philosophy that really relates to language learning. It's seeing, it's imitating, it's not pushing it too hard. It's doing the things that sometimes things that, you know, are, are enjoyable, that you can continue doing. It's all of that kind of a fuzzy thing. It's not deliberate memorization. Uh, in our Japanese prophet, you have to know how to write the characters. I would, to me, characters, kanji is part of learning Japanese. If all you want to do is go to the bar and drink beer and chat people up, then you don't need the characters. But if you want to learn the language, I believe, uh, you know, you need the characters. You know, how do you maintain motivation if people aren't interested in your success? You don't learn language for other people. You learn language for yourself. Xiangshan, no. <laughs> Xiangshan is not fragrant mountain. Xiangshan is, Xiangshan is mutual sound. Xiangshan. All right. The way I study Japanese in part is to find plus one phrase. Key, thank you a lot. Okay. Fragrant mountain, no. Xiangshan, there we go. Is a phrase. Pensez-vous que l'apprentissage des langues peut vous rendre narcissique? No, I don't think that lang learning languages makes you narcissistic. Um, cross talk just like the talk show. Uh, what's your thought on reading books and listening to audiobooks? Do they feel the same to you? Um, you know, uh, if 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 I'm say in a, if i if i have dedicated time i'm going to read i enjoy reading i enjoy reading because i can go at my own speed i can imagine what i'm reading i can stop where i want i like reading the advantage of listening is that i can do it in the car i can do it while exercising i can do it in so many different places i would not sit down and listen say to an audiobook but i can recollect uh cross-country skiing for hours listening to uh, you know, Russian novels, Italian novels, whatever. Uh, it's different. It's a different experience. It's part of the same. In a sense, it's the same because, you know, writing was invented before the MP3 player. Uh, both uh, are ways, you know, audio recording, writing are simply ways of recording what people say. Uh, prior to that, we had to rely on storytellers. Uh, they're both good. And I think some people may prefer the one or the other. I find that listening tends to, you know, I don't know where it goes in the brain, but it tends to prepare you better for speaking, whereas reading is better for acquiring vocabulary, but I do both. Uh, knowing how to write them by hand improves recognition. Say my English got better watching words, at least writing wise, I don't really speak. Yeah, but if you had an opportunity to speak. Have you heard about the silent way as an approach to speaking? What do you think? Okay. So there are, there's a fellow in Thailand who has a program for learning Thai and he is adamant that no one should speak Thai, you know, until they've gone through six months or something. Like he forbids his people to speak. I'm against any sort of, uh, you know, prohibition of speaking. If I were in Thailand learning Thai from scratch, <laughs> from day one, I'd be out there trying out whatever I could. That's, that's what I would be motivated to do. Why would I, you know, deny myself the pleasure of trying out the few words that I've learned? On the other hand, though, if I'm, say, in Vancouver learning Thai, I would not be pushing myself to speak to someone because I think the time that I spend listening and reading is going to bring me better, uh, be more benefits. But uh, now that I have enough uh, Persian, when I get back to Vancouver and I run into Persian shopkeepers or clerks in department stores, and there are lots of them, you can bet I'm going to use whatever Persian I have. Is Link comprehensive enough to be my only Mandarin learning tool? I'm still at a very early, early level. Okay. I, you know, I've said this before, whatever we learn, if we can learn it using different content, different forms so we listen we read we grab a book 
Uh, we cover the same material. I like to buy two different starter books, teach yourself colloquial. So I would not rely on one system alone. Uh, Link has a big advantage with, like it, to me, it's very unfortunate that these starter books like Teach Yourself or Asimil don't make their material available in digital format so that it can be imported into Link and that we can study them, we can look up words, and we can use all of the benefits of the Link system in combination with these textbooks. And so then, like I'm doing right now with Asimil, which I have imported into Link, I sometimes do it on my iPad and sometimes I grab the book. So uh, I would not limit myself. I think it's good for the brain, again, to have uh, you know, different approaches, different forms, this kind of thing. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's good to learn through songs. I'm going to try this good. Go for it. What is, have you ever tried Irish or any Celtic language? No. So. Uh, Mundo Mike feels that he's not learning even though he's studying much. Again, if you're, if you're studying, that's not the best way. If you are engaging with the language, if you are enjoying the language, you're listening, you're reading, you're speaking to people, all of these things that you're doing with the language, you are necessarily improving. Okay? So, and if you're enjoying what you're doing, you will improve. Uh, if you are deliberately studying, uh, going over the same grammar explanations, doing the same exercises, yes, you will gradually achieve less and less and less. So give yourself some new exposure to the language, go find some new content, do things that are different, and that'll stimulate new uh, activity in the brain. Thank you for answering my question. I told my Korean friend about Steve's channel. Now my friend will subscribe to your channel with me. You are such a nice guy. Well, thank you. And uh, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm actually planning to get back to Korean in the second half of the year because I'm going to uh, the Polyglot Conference in uh, Japan, in Fukuoka in October. I think there will be people there from Korea and it's just a good excuse to get my Korean to a higher level, which means I will park my Arabic and Persian and focus in on, well, first of all, I park my Arabic and Persian because I'm gonna go to Ukraine, so I gotta get my Slavic languages back. And then I'm going to go to Korean. So maybe we can chat in Korean one day. Prati Afrikaans? No. That I don't understand, but maybe one day. Some research suggests that listening to audiobooks and reading books are pretty much identical activities as far as brain activity is concerned. As long as you don't lose concentration, that could well be. I don't know. Do you have a Chinese name? Yeah, I do. It's uh, Gao, like Gao Si Zhu. Gao is in Gao. Si, si Xiang Si, Zhu Xian De Zhu. Gao Si Zhu. I've been learning five languages, Chinese, Irish, Greek, Arabic, and Japanese for quite some time, and I know with no Russian mastering any name tips for managing this many different languages. No, I, I, I can't imagine doing that. Uh, I'm having trouble uh, going back and forth between Persian and Arabic, where there's some mutual sort of reinforcement, at least on the vocabulary side. I, I don't know what to say. Uh, I hope it works for you. Uh, blah, blah, blah. If a person that has both parents that speak European language was born in Chinese, for example, would he learn Chinese slower than his Chinese peers having the same linguistic environment as them? Probably, like uh, no different than a Chinese immigrant to, to an English-speaking country who speaks Chinese at home and then learns uh, English from his peers. One thing to remember, the influence of the peers is much more important than the influence of the parents, all right? Uh, people often say, well, you know, the mother, uh, mother uh, corrects the child and blah, 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 and so therefore we have to correct a lot. We don't have to correct a lot. If the peers, were not the greater influence, then the children of immigrants would end up speaking like their parents, which they don't. The children of immigrants end up speaking like their peers. So the peer is a much bigger influence. Hi, Steve, you follow <laughs> Ukrainian elections. Do you have an informed opinion? No, I have not an informed opinion. Uh, you know, this is Sergei Orlov. All I can say is I have, you know, what can I say? I, the Ukrainians, you know, learning Ukrainian was, I really enjoyed learning Ukrainian. I enjoyed reading history books in Ukrainian, Ukrainian, listening to audio books, listening to Hromatske Radio, where they have some very good uh, podcasts, you know, sort of really solid 
sensible people. But like in every country, starting with the United States, Canada, you name it, you've got the whole gamut of people, uh, of, of opinions, of uh, crazies, of uh, you name it. And Ukraine is no different. But it just seems to me that throughout history, Ukraine has like, you know, you had, uh, you know, Galicia call it, where the uh, Danilo had this princedom, dukedom, whatever it was. And then they were conquered by the Lithuanians, who are more or less tolerant. And then they had the Poles come in there and they wanted to force them to become Roman Catholic Poles. And so that created a lot of bitterness and the Hamelnitsky rebellion. He took a, took a part of Ukraine off to Russia. So, and they were kind of buffeted between the Tatars and the, <laughs> the, uh, even the Germans and the Lithuanians and the Poles and the Russians. And so they've kind of had a tough time. So here you have Ukraine now sort of finally establishing itself as an equal member of the European community of nations alongside Poland, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, and France, and Italy, and stuff. And they're having their difficulties. And uh, of course, it's difficult for Russia to let go, uh, just like it was difficult for France to let Algeria go. Uh, it's difficult for Spain to accept the Catalan. It was difficult in Canada for English Canada to, to recognize that Quebec, the Quebecois wanted a sense of their own thing. Now, to squeak by referendums in Quebec, you know, uh, which, you know, we managed to avoid a separation, but it might have happened. It might have happened. And so there's all kinds of, you know, uh, nostalgia, what was and stuff like that. And so, but in all of this, you know, I have no idea. And, and of course, the corruption in Ukraine is such a fabulously rich country, rich agriculture, high technology, very smart people, IT and all this stuff. And uh, hardworking, you travel around there and certainly in Western Ukraine, their homes are so well maintained and they build their little shrines, but the roads are terrible. Uh, there's corruption, there's stuff like that. I mean, I, my only hope, I have no idea about the candidates. My only hope is that, that, that Ukraine is able to solve its problems and move forward. And I'm looking forward to going there. And I love listening to the Ukrainian just as much as I love listening to Russian. And uh, I won't even get on the subject of, of uh, officially recognizing Russian because it gets all the Ukrainians upset. But R Russian culture is also a major part of, of Ukraine. And it's, in today's environment, of course, with the Russians uh, doing what they're doing in, in Donbass, that's not a popular opinion. But so there you have it, briefly on Ukraine. Now I'll get a bunch of nasty comments. Uh, so um, how can I improve my speaking fast? Nothing happens fast in language learning, okay? But to speak well, you have to speak a lot. And you first of all have to build up your passive vocabulary, your comprehension, and then you really have to speak a lot. And then if you do that, your fluency will gradually improve, but everything improves slowly. Well, I'll be very happy when Steve comes to Korea. When I improve my Korean, I will be there. I don't... Okay, how do I know which words are important? I wouldn't worry about it so much. Um, sometimes the least important words are the words that you remember. The most important words are ones that you forget. Um, you know, if, if, if you don't want the word, like if you're at length, if I don't want the word, I don't bother with it. I might still save it. I don't deliberately try to remember anything. My right, listening company is not good. Any advice? Listen more and then read what you listen to. How is your Hanji Kanji recognition handwriting ability right now, considering you're no longer learning these languages? Do you have to write? Okay. No, I don't write anymore. I haven't written since my, I had a, I had to write a test in 1969. I had to translate newspaper editorials into Chinese. I could write. Since then, I haven't written. If you don't write all the time, you, you quickly lose the ability to write. But I have no difficulty recognizing Chinese, so I maintain it by reading, and I can write with a word process with the, with the computer. Brazil, Mairo Vergara, I know him, who says that speak the language, but it's no fluent. It's completely wrong, because he says you speak your fluent. Sorry. I know Mairo. He says that a person who says that it's completely wrong because he said, if you speak, you're fluent. What do you think? 
Uh, okay, I don't. I, I'd like to hear that from Miro. I don't know exactly what he said, but uh, I think the goal is fluency. Fluency doesn't mean perfect. You can still make mistakes and be fluency. Uh, now, when I started German and Italian from scratch, I began with Asimil using Luca and his back. Yeah, I mean, Luca is a phenomenal polyglot. He works with this translation, bi-directional translation. I don't have the patience to do it. It might be a very good method. I tend to be more of a Zen, you know, uh, uh, Taoist, you know, line of least resistance. So I just believe more in the sort of gradual exposure. Okay, I want to work as a translator. Good, good luck. Which culture uh, that you have immersed yourself in has provided you with the richest history and culture? All, all. I mean, okay, check. You know, 10 million people. But to get, they have a, um, a, a website, the radio, uh, you know, Czeski Eroslas has a series on Czech history, Austro Hungarian Empire, blah, blah, blah. It's all good. Arabic, Persian, Persia. Like, there's a tremendous culture there. Arabic. So, no, they're all good. If you remember, you said you worked for the Canadian government as a diplomat. How did you get into such a profession? Do you need to speak another language? Okay. Got a bunch of questions, gonna to try to get through them all here, but the uh, there was a diplomatic exam. So I don't know what the situation is today, but in those days, maybe 20,000 people write it and they choose 50 people. So any, anything you can do to make yourself stand out is gonna help. So I wrote my exam in French, even though I was an Anglophone. That I think improved my chances. Uh, then they look at so many things. Like in those days, they wanted to get people from different parts of the country. Nowadays, they want to get men and women. Uh, they want people with different backgrounds, engineer, doctor, political science, whatever. So it's, it's more of a lottery than anything else. I don't know how it works today. And it's, it's a learning process such as beginner, able to speak, da, 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 or just three non beginner. Okay, that's totally arbitrary, Mateos. How we divide up the levels, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite arbitrary. Okay. Yes, uh, I see many people improving, I don't, and the advice about, okay, so do you think pronunciation and intonation are important? Of course they're important, but they're not the most important thing. I know people in Canada who speak with very pronounced accents. I used to have a Swiss banker guy, strong, that's how they speak in Switzerland, but his use of words was so good. He spoke better than most native speakers. So the focus on your ability to use words, and you can also work on the pronunciation, but it's not as important as long as people can understand you. And the, the better control you have of the language overall, and the more listening you do, chances are your uh, pronunciation will improve. But I've come to resent the language a lot. Okay, so <laughs> if you resent the language, it's hard to learn. And this is not an uncommon thing if you're living somewhere and the locals, like typically at first you arrive somewhere and it's all new and different and stuff. And after a while, the locals start to rub you the wrong way. And then uh, so many things you resent and then you resent the language. Maybe either you move or try to find something in the local language, local culture, some friends, something that you could like. It's better if you can find something to like. You don't have to like them all. You don't have to be blind to the, say, shortcomings of the locals, but you have to find something positive, in my opinion. Uh, graded readers, what do you think of them? I mean, graded readers are good because, but it depends on the subject matter. Personally, I'm not that interested in reading graded fiction. I would be interested in seeing graded readers on Arabic history or Persian history or things of that nature. Whereas stories, I'm not so keen. And it's difficult. The graded readers very often, because they're stories, there's a lot of vocabulary in there that in fact is not so relevant. So graded, Nonfiction, I would be very keen on with audio. We had that in Chinese and it was great. Uh, I'm not very interested in Esperanto. I'm not against Esperanto, but I'm not motivated to learn it. I have never sat on an airplane as it happened to me when I was flying from, from uh, Iguazu Falls in Brazil to Rio. And I sat beside a gentleman who turned out a rancher from Paraguay who was of Ukrainian origin. We spoke Ukrainian. I have never come across anyone who speaks Esperanto. There is no Esperanto country. Personally, I'm not motivated, but a lot of people are into Esperanto. That's fine. It has the advantage, apparently, of being easy to learn. So that would be a reason to teach it in schools so that 
kids realize that in fact they can learn a language but if they're not motivated then that won't work either i want to buy french popular literature and ebooks on amazon and they won't sell it to me man i want to read okay i mean find other sources the problem is that now a lot of those ebooks are protected so you can't import them but you should be able to find other booksellers uh, you know i shed i don't know who the other uh, you know, um, and find uh, audiobooks for these ebooks. I have been only motivated by continuing reading new content, but realize I should always be more attention. Your time to spend reading old lessons. Well, again, Edwin, uh, right now where I am in Arabic and Farsi, I'm spending 50% of my time on old lessons because I'm not good enough to hit the, the new stuff. And I've got to get out of that, but it's difficult. And there's still so much in the old lessons that I don't. And I struggle with this. Maybe I shouldn't be forcing myself to get better at the old stuff, but the new stuff is too difficult. It's that intermediate level stuff that's missing. Uh, his appearance said, no, I haven't seen this guy on Chilean TV. What do you think about online tutors that don't make corrections for you? I don't expect my tutor to make corrections. Uh, I won't remember them anyway. Uh, I rely on the tutors send me my report, which contains 10 or 15 phrases that I used incorrectly or the sh words that she introduced to me and I study that. But while we are talking, I focus on communicating. I don't think there's much benefit in correcting on the fly. We don't remember the corrections anyway. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to call it here. We, we went way over time today. Okay, thank you and uh, look forward to the next one.